Hey everyone, I'm Catherine and welcome to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about the hectic case of Lorena and John Wayne Bobbitt. Now I remember when I was little hearing, I guess you would call this an old wives tale, thinking that can't be true, that's not real. And after researching this case to find the true facts and that this horrific incident was in fact real, I mean, I have to say, this is probably one of my favorite true crime cases to discuss. And by the end of this video, you're probably thinking that you remember hearing about this when you were a child as well. Let's jump right into this one. You're gonna wanna stick around until the end. In 1967, John Wayne Bobbitt was born. Now he was born in New York City and his father left his family soon after he was born so he had no relationship with his father. In fact, he actually had no idea who his father was. Now John Wayne Bobbitt's mother was an addict and she wasn't around a lot. Now in interviews, whenever John was asked about his mother, he would usually respond words to the effect of, she was a nice lady but she wasn't around a lot. So John actually had four brothers and John's aunt and uncle ended up taking him and his brothers in to care for them because John's dad left and he had no idea who his father was and his mother, she was an addict and she had a lot of issues. So he actually was raised by his auntie and his uncle. Now the auntie and uncle are reported to say that there was a lot of fighting going on in their household, which you would expect. I mean, four young boys, you would expect that. They were raised well and they even went to church on Sundays. So later in John's life, he actually ended up joining the Marines. And when people would ask him, well, why did you join the Marines? He would say, I don't know, my friends were doing it, so I did it. All right, so let's talk about Lorena Bobbitt. So in 1969, Lorena was born in Ecuador. And when she was seven years old, she and her family moved to Venezuela. So when Lorena was asked about her family life, she said that her family were very poor, but she grew up in a great family and that her family was full of love. So her parents never got divorced. They stayed together and they loved each other. So Lorena was born and raised a strict Catholic. When she reached her teen years, she wasn't allowed to date or go out without a chaperone. So when I say extreme Catholic, I mean extreme Catholic. So Lorena's country when she was born was a poor country and she recalls watching American TV shows like The Price is Right on TV and seeing people win cars and massive prizes. And she used to sit at home and think, I wanna live there. America, the land of the great, that's where I want to live. And so from a very young age, Lorena had always wanted to move to America. So when Lorena was 16 years old, she went on her first holiday to America. When she turned 18, she actually got a, a visa and then she was able to start college in America. So she was living out her dream. In 1988, Lorena and John Wayne Bobbitt met at a marine ball and Lorena describes John as handsome, so handsome, wearing his marine attire and so charming and so charismatic and as soon as she met him she knew she loved him. So John described Lorena as shy and timid and innocent and he asked her to dance and he said that they got along so well and at the marine ball they just had a fantastic time. And in 1989, the, the couple actually got married. So while they were dating, of course, Lorena had a chaperone and she recalls saying to her chaperone, who's sort a of family friend, I don't need you, you know, we're very happy, I'm safe with John, everything's all good. And the chaperone's reported to have said, if I don't chaperone you, your family will kill you, strict Catholic thing. But the chaperone gave evidence later that she always got a strange vibe and feeling from John. For example, whenever the couple would go out, John would always forget his wallet and Lorena paid for everything. Now, when the chaperones would raise this with Lorena, Lorena would say, oh, it's all good, I got this, like, why, it doesn't really matter. Like, I love him, we love each other, leave it alone, he's just forgotten his wallet. But there were a few strange things that the chaperones started to pick up on and that they actually raised with Lorena while they were dating and before they got married. The chaperones described John as very charismatic and very charming, but all of them said that they got the strange vibe from him. So both John and Lorena have different stories regarding who proposed to who. So Lorena says that John definitely proposed to her and John actually says that it was Lorena who kind of proposed to him. Regardless, they got married and that was that. So after the marriage, Lorena was ecstatic. You know, she'd married a military man, she's living in America and she was living her dream, her childhood, childhood dream. So Lorena's evidence is that the wonderful honeymoon period came to a screaming halt just within a week of being married. 
She says that she noticed a change in John's personality literally within seven days of being married and he started becoming physical with her. So Lorena says that John started to put her down, started to swear at her and just started to belittle her on the daily. She recalls the first time he got physical with her, she, John and his friend were out drinking at a pub and John was highly intoxicated. So you'll see later on in this video, I explained John developed somewhat of an alcohol addiction. He was very dependent on alcohol and this might've been an early phase of that. Regardless, they were at the pub, he was very drunk. They all got in the car and John decided to drink drive all him, Lorena and his friend home. So Lorena was in the passenger seat, his friend was in the back seat and John was so drunk. He was, Lorena says he was swerving all over the road. And at one stage she was saying, pull over, pull over. You, you can't drive, you're very intoxicated. And she got the steering wheel and she went to pull the steering wheel to get back on the road. Now, in response to this, John turned around, stopped the car and started punching Lorena repeatedly in her chest. She remembers that. That was the first time that he physically assaulted her. The first of many. So in 1991, John was actually discharged from the military. Now, I tried to find out why he was discharged and I couldn't find it online. But at the end of this video and after understanding a bit more about his personality in a larger context, I mean, I can imagine, I can imagine why. So after being discharged from the military, John had a couple of short, non-long lasting jobs and he really struggled to find employment. Now to support the family, Lorena started working two jobs and she worked for a lady named Jenna Bazzati. Now Jenna was a single mom and she owned three nail salons and a very successful businesswoman and she had children of her own and Lorena really looked up to her. You know, she was she was so beautiful. She always dressed to the nines. She had her makeup done, her nails done. And Lorena would say, how do you do this? How do you run all these businesses? You have your kids, your life is perfect. How do you do this? And she said, you know, I work real hard. And so Lorena said, well, I don't wanna work hard too. I wanna be like you. And so Lorena asked whether she could get a job in one of her nail salons. So at the time she started working in one of Jenna's nail salons and she was also doing nannying duties for, for Jenna. So while Lorena was out working her two jobs, John would stay home and he would drink. So in 1991, Lorena fell pregnant with her and John's child. Now, Lorena gives evidence that John had always expressed that he wanted children. And so she was excited to, to tell John. And she says that when she told John, John flew into a fit of rage and was basically saying, you know, how do you think that we're going to have a child? How are you going to work? How are you going to work? And, you know, Lorena would respond, well, you could get a job. I could stay home. And John was like, no, nah, I'm not having it. Flew into a fit of rage. Apparently he went and got the yellow book or whatever the American example of the book is. And he basically said, you go to this clinic, you get this sorted out. Well, you're not having this child. You go here, you get this sorted out or I'm leaving you. We're separating and I'll make you go back to your own country. So lovely John, that's how he responded with the news of their first pregnancy. And you might be wondering, well, why did she stay with John? I mean, in 1991, times were different. She, she didn't want the marriage to end. She actually still loved him. And she said that she still had hope that he would go back to the man that she first met. So she always clung on to hope that he would change back to the man she met at that military ball and that he might change back or he might get better. So eventually, Lorena agreed to go to the clinic and have the procedure to suit John because John didn't want to have the child. Now, Lorena's evidence and the, the evidence of the lady that was at the clinic, one of the nurses, is that Lorena was Lorena and John both went together to the clinic and Lorena was beside herself. She was shaking. She was obviously so upset that she had to have this procedure done. And apparently John was sitting next to her laughing, laughing hysterically, laughing at her, such that the nurse had to come over and basically say, all right, what, what's going on here? Like, we're gonna have to take her away from you and separated Lorena from John because he was basically laughing at her sitting there shaking. She was shaking hysterically and crying. And when he started laughing, the nurse was like, what is going on? And had to literally take Lorena into a different room. So she wasn't sitting next to John who was laughing, obviously laughing at how funny it was that she didn't wanna be there. She didn't wanna have the procedure. And the nurse was so disgusted that she came and took Lorena into a separate room and was like, are you okay? Like, you, you shouldn't be around that. What's going on? So after the procedure, Lorena and John's life went on. So Lorena kept working her two jobs to support the family and John kept staying at home and drinking his days away. 
Lorena gave evidence that it was quite common that she would get home from work and John wouldn't be home and she'd say that he was in other women's apartment complexes. So they lived in a, a building of apartments and she would always say that he was in other women's complexes. She says that she was way too scared to, to raise his potential cheating uh, in fear of how he would respond. So physically and abuse verbally. And, you know, she, she did cling on to that hope that again, he might change one day, but things were getting worse and worse in their household. So there are so many examples of John treating Lorena so poorly, but I'm only going to cover a few in this video. Uh, one example is Lorena's mum traveled to America to spend time with John and Lorena. At this stage, they were actually living in a house. So Lorena was working two jobs to pay for the, a mortgage for John to stay at home and drink in while she went out and worked. Anyway, her mum come over to visit the family and Lorena says that John was on his best behavior. John was so lovely to her mum, so charming, so charismatic. And her mum was like, wow, you've got a real keeper here. And of course, because of the Catholic nature of her family, divorce was, she didn't want to get a divorce. So she was like, yes, he's on his best behavior. Mum's here, mum loves him. And Lorena reports that there was a Macy Gray parade on at that time. So there was one instance where she and her mum were in the kitchen and they were cooking and everything was all good. John was in the lounge room, he was watching football and Lorena walks into the lounge room and she changes the channel so she could quickly show her mum the Macy Gray Parade. Now, Lorena's evidence is that when she changed the TV channel, John flipped the switch. He went, flew into one of his aggressive, abusive rages and was just going crazy. And she said it was so embarrassing that her mum saw it. However, her mom responded by saying, well, why would you upset him? Why would you change the channel then? So you have to remember way back when, different time, different era, the mom was thinking, well, why are you upsetting your husband? But the impact of her mom's response, I mean, I guess, I'm, I'm guessing here, this is my opinion, might have been that it reinforced for Lorena that the husband is right and that she's in the wrong and that she should do everything to suit him. So that is one example of John. I think it's, uh, my opinion is that it's an example of potentially narcissistic trait. So he does the whole charismatic charming, you know, when they first met at the Marine ball, he does the charismatic charming act when the mum's first there because he likes to get everyone on side with his charm at the start. And then as soon as the smallest thing happened, he flipped back and the, the narcissistic mask drops off for a quick second and her mother saw his behavior on that day. So you can see that's one example where his true colors came out, but he did a great job of charming the mother for the first part of her visit. So Lorena describes that John would often call her too fat, too wide, too ugly. He'd explain that no one else would ever want her and that this really impacted her emotionally. Now, another tactic John used to manipulate Lorena was that, so, you know, she's not an American, but she was here before she met John, but he would always say things to her like, if, if I leave you, I'm going to get you sent back to your home country. And she would respond like, you know, you, you can't, I've got the visa. It's not to do with you, etc." And John would say, I'm an American. I'll make it happen. I'm an American. You're not, I can, I choose what happens here. I can get you taken back home. And Lorena had no idea. So she was thinking, is, is that, is there a way? I don't know. So she felt like her residence in America was always at risk if she didn't keep John happy. And another really crazy thing John would always do was, so Lorena obviously had a passport and other documentation which would allow her to stay in America. During arguments, what John would often do is he'd get her documents and he'd hide them from her and basically say, I'm not giving you your documents back, so good luck, blah, blah, blah. So he would hide her um, personal, you know, her passport, her documentation, her, her everything. So if she wanted to go home or if she wanted to stay, she couldn't even prove who she was. And that was a tactic that she said really impacted her emotionally and he did it very frequently. So the neighbors actually gave evidence that they could often hear John screaming at Lorena. And on one occasion, one of the neighbors was so concerned that they called the police. The police showed up and they knocked on the door and John answered the door. And the police officer said that they could actually smell the alcohol coming out of the house. And they called Lorena to the front door and they could just see that there was something that was not right. And they spoke to Lorena and he, he got in some trouble for domestic violence at that, at that time. So unfortunately, John's violence towards Lorena started to escalate. Now, I need to be careful with the word that I say on YouTube. I'm not allowed to say a particular word, so I'm going to use the word maped or mape. Okay, so use your imagination. So John started to mape Lorena pretty frequently. So his violence against her started to escalate in that respect. So there started to become a pattern where Lorena would go out, she'd go to work, she'd work her two jobs, she would come home, John would be drunk and he would 
conduct those types of acts upon her and she became worse and worse she mentally she she just was so damaged and on one occasion she actually went to a police station to report everything that had happened and this came out it was it was confirmed by the police and the police station and everything so she went to a police station to report all of the things that were happening to her and she was told look the police officer that would need to take your statement is out doing so and so you need to come back in three hours and she explained i can't i need to do it now i need to give the statement right now there are reasons i, I need to do it now timing and she was told well you'd have to wait and she left the police station and she didn't go back and that obviously perhaps john was going to be home or something like that but um there's evidence that she she did go to the police station to make the report and she was told that you'd have to come back in three hours and she couldn't do it she couldn't come back in three hours so with respect to evidence to show that john kind of had a liking for inflicting pain on women and making and doing it when they didn't want to do it so mate that was his thing that turned him on that was what he liked uh, there was evidence given by some of his basketball friends that he would sometimes go to basketball and brag to them about how he would do it and how that's what he liked. So the evidence didn't just come from Lorena. There was other evidence from other people like his basketball uh, friends who would talk about how he would brag about it and how that's what he was into and that's what he liked. And, and so the evidence wasn't just coming from Lorena with respect to that aspect of the case. So now we move on to the night of the incident. 23rd June 1993. So John basically said to Lorena, one of my friends will be staying at our house for a few weeks or a few months. And Lorena was like, yeah, okay, that's fine. So one afternoon, John and his friend come back to their house and Lorena makes a comment about, oh, you're staying up with us for a while. And the friend says, John told me that you're gonna build me a room at the back of your house. And Lorena's like, what? You're gonna be living with us? So that wasn't discussed with me. And then John flies into a fit of rage in front of his friend, basically turns the argument on Lorena. How dare you? Blah, blah, blah. This is not your choice. Blah, 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 blah. So they have a huge argument because John's obviously said to Lorena to butter it over that the friend will only be staying there for a few months. But he's gone and told his friend, yeah, we'll, we'll build you a room. You can stay at our house. So John and his friend proceed to go out on a night of drinking and Lorena stays home after her big, long day of working. So the, John and his friend come back to the house at about 4 a.m. in the morning. So John gave evidence that he wasn't that drunk, but his friend gave evidence that they were both absolutely blind. So John had at least five or six beers and several shots. So, you know, they were shoot, two sheets to the wind. They were definitely highly intoxicated. And so John comes home four o'clock in the morning, comes into the room forcefully, extremely forcefully, mapes his wife, while she lay there asleep. And after the incident, which was very forceful, very violent, very abusive, Lorena starts to cry and she's shaking and she's, she, she can't cope with what's just happened and she starts to have a bit of a panic attack. Now, Lorena gets out of her bed and she goes to the kitchen to have a glass of water. And she says that she opened the fridge door and the light from the fridge started shining on a knife that was on the bench. And as this was happening, she said that she was remembering all of the abuse that she'd endured from John. You know, the first time he physically assaulted her, the first time he maped her, the 10th time he maped her, all of the times that this happened. And she says that she was just taken over. Now, while she's thinking about all the times that he's abused her and everything that's happened in their relationship, noting that just moments before this, he'd maped her violently. She says that she got the knife, she goes into the room, she pulls over the blanket where John slept, she lifts his Johnson up, so his member, she gets the knife and she cuts it off. <laughs> so she cut off his Johnson. She then leaves the house. She gets in her car. So she's apparently driving. She's got one knife and one knife in one hand, the Johnson in the other, and she's driving and she's, oh my God, oh my God, I've just done this thing. Apparently John was so drunk that he didn't even notice that it had happened until literally minutes later when he reports that he felt like he'd wet the bed. 
So, of course, John wakes up and he's yelling out to his friend, help, help, help me, help me. The friend gets up. The friend's absolutely blind. They're both blind. They're like, oh, my God, he's, Johnson has just been cut off. He's apparently spurting out blood. And the friend's like, oh, my God, oh, my God, we've got to drive you to the hospital. The friend drives John to the hospital. And apparently the nurses, some of the nurses gave evidence that they were like, what did he do? <laughs> What's happening to that asshole? So John shows up to the emergency department with his friend and he has been, his whole Johnson has been cut off. And the nurses and the hospital staff said that they had never seen anything like this before. Now, you have to remember that this happened in the 1990s. So uh, there are reports from the police officers that like they were on the radio and they're like, we're looking for an appendage. <laughs> we're looking for an appendage. But it was almost like they were uncomfortable to say, you know, a man's penis has been cut off. We're searching for it. So <laughs> there's like the evidence of them reporting to each other that we're looking for an appendage blah 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 and you have to think about what the, the police officers were thinking they probably went home and vacuumed the whole house after searching for the appendage so Lorena says that she's driving past the 7-Eleven and she throws the member out the window. She then goes and puts the knife in a trash can. She's like panicky. She drives to her boss's house, so Jenna's house, and she basically is like, oh, this is what's happened. Jenna freaks out and she's like, whoa, look at all that blood. Jenna ends up calling the police and the police come and take Lorena and she accompanies her. Now they go to the hospital. Lorena explains what had just happened to her. So she'd been odd, maped, and they do an kit on her and they can see well there has it looks like there's been some forceful stuff happening here so they do that now apparently Lorena starts by telling the police officers um you know he's so selfish he's so selfish whenever we have he never lets me finish first and it's like oh that is not you could have started anywhere and that's where you chose to start there are way more instances where he's phys been physical but anyway this is a woman who has been so traumatized and the police have got her they've taken her her, they've done the R kit on her. So Lorena eventually tells the police where she threw the appendage and apparently there's all these police officers that are out looking for it and one of the police officers stand on it and he's like, oh, it's here, it's here, someone, it's here, it's here. <laughs> and, and I shouldn't be laughing, he was actually quite traumatized over it. So one of the other officers came and picked up the member, went into the 7-Eleven, got a cup with ice, put it in the ice, and then they took the member back to the hospital. Now, when they got back to the hospital, John was in surgery for more than 10 hours, and they were actually able to surgically reattach the member. Now, the staff at the hospital actually said that as soon as they reattached it, it filled up with blood immediately, and it looked like the surgery had gone very, very well. I mean, it's kind of good that she told the police where it was. She didn't have to, and she basically told them, this is where you'll find it, and the surgery was a success. Okay, so people found out about this case and it went viral. Like globally, everyone was talking about this case. This is that case where the wife was annoyed and cut off the husband. So this is where the wives tale part comes into it. I mean, I definitely heard, I mean, a few different variations from the facts, but I definitely heard about this happening when I was younger. Did you? Have you heard about this case or a variation of this case? And now you're actually learning the true facts behind what happened in the Bobbit case? All right, so let's talk about the, the cases that happened after the incident. So initially, John was actually, well, they tried to charge and prosecute him for the R. And, you know, he, he, he would always say to Lorena, you know, anytime I want it, you're my wife, you're my wife, I take it when I want it. And the law back then was actually that there was no, if you live with someone, it couldn't be R. So you couldn't actually have marital R. So Lorena was like, you mean to tell me that he was actually right when he would tell me wherever you are, whenever I want it, I can take it just because we live together. So he was right that he could be doing that to me. So it was all, all kinds of messed up. But the law back then was that he, he was actually acquitted. It couldn't be R because they were married and they lived together. So, I mean... So the next court case related to Lorena inflicting the harm upon John. Now... There were so many witness testimony that got up and they said, look, he's been abusing her for years. It wasn't just Lorena. They had several people that stood up and were like, yeah. So you had the basketball friend saying, yeah, he bragged to us. That's what he liked. He, we, you know, you had other, the, the police officers who said, yeah, she came and partly reported, but didn't give a formal statement because we told her to come back. And there were several other, other family friend neighbors who would say, yep, yeah, we saw her with bruises. It was 
yep, we've seen this happening for years and years and years. So um, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it was well established that the abuse was happening. Now, when Lorena was in the stand, you could quite clearly see that she was very emotional and very honest when she was giving her evidence. And when John was in the stand, in cross-examination, he was absolutely pumped. Like, you could tell that he was just lying through his teeth. So um, his evidence was much less compelling than L Lorena's evidence. You know, it, it was quite well established that there had been a, a long history of quite traumatizing and devastating so that she'd, she'd suffered because of him. So that was where the evidence took the case with respect to her assault on him. So the legal question for determination was whether Lorena had premeditated that incident. Lorena said, nope, I didn't premeditate the incident. He came home, there was a violent on me. I w went crazy for a moment. When I went into the kitchen and I was reminiscing on all of that, you know, him saying, I'll find you anywhere you are. I'll find you. I'll take it. When I want it, I'll take it. All of these things are going through her mind. And she says, no, I lost my mind for a split second. There was no premeditation. I was in the kitchen and I, that happened. Now, her defense team actually negotiated with the prosecution a plea deal. So if Lorena pled guilty, they were offering her four months in jail. So when you're staring down the barrel of over 20 years or four months, I mean... It, it would be very, very hard not to take the plea deal. But Lorena didn't. She said, no, I'm not going to admit on record that it was something that's not true. I did not premeditate that. I've had years of trauma and assaults and that's what led to this mental snap. So she, she stuck to her word and she stuck to her ground. She did not take the plea deal. All right, so drum roll. The outcome was, yeah, so she got off for reason of temporary mental um, insanity. So the court accepted that it wasn't premeditated. There was enough evidence to substantiate that she'd endured so many years of trauma that she had a mental snap and that it wasn't premeditated. So Lorena was successful in defending her herself in that case. All right, so let's talk about where John and Lorena are now. So Lorena met a man named David in the 19, late 1990s and they've been together for almost 20 years. Together they have a daughter named Olivia and they seem really happy. Uh, Lorena started a, she, so she's developed the Red Wagon, Lorena Red Wagon, which is a foundation for women who have suffered domestic abuse. So Lorena and her little family are doing really well. Now let's talk about John. All right, so as recently as 2020, John has been married and divorced three times and he was living in Vegas because he received some cash settlement in response to some, some injury. But let's talk about what he did soon after the incident. So you'll remember that his member was surgically reattached. Now, soon after that, John actually made a, so I can't say the word, but use your imagination, prawn O. He made a prono. So I guess the, the, the reason he did it was to show people that it was still working. Now, the name of the first prono was <laughs> John Wayne Buffett Uncut. <laughs> so six months after the incident, he made a prono called John Wayne Buffett Uncut, where you could clear, clearly see that the member was very much working. So um, John, you know, became a little bit, I guess you would say famous for a little while about after he had, he had made the prono and he went on the Howard Stern show. Now on the Howard Stern show, people were calling up and asking him all these questions. And apparently there was some foundation where you could donate money so he could get an extension of his member. And apparently they, I think they raised over $200,000 or something like that. So John then got an extension to his member and then he did another prono and the name of the second prono was Franken Penis. <laughs> All right, so what do you think about this case? Have you heard of this case before? Have you heard of variations? And uh, what do you think of the fact that Lorena was found not guilty by reason of temporary insanity? What are your comments on this case? I'd love to know. If you like this video, don't forget to like it. And if you like this content, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and I will see you in the next one. See you guys.